Okay, cool. It started recording. Um, yeah, so hope you are okay. Here we go. Let me even do this. Okay, yeah, I hope you're doing well. Um, it's it's been a busy week, and not just in terms of the world, but also in terms of organic chemistry, right? Um, I mean, you know, the past few weeks uh, of workshop, at least, we've been uh, we've had all these quizzes and assignments and things just piling up, um, and now there's there's nothing coming up for like a week or two, right? Um, but that's not to say that there's not a ton of stuff to learn. In fact, like if there's a time when this class really starts to ramp up, it's now, in my opinion, at least. Um, that doesn't necessarily apply to everyone, but yeah. Uh, you've gotten all of the things that you need to know to be able to start really doing reactions, like like lots of reactions, a lot of them. Um, and well, if you saw the lectures, you would know that, well, now is the time where um, you just start learning them, right? Like there's, there are lists of reactions that you could do and well, you, you go through them. So last week you started talking about alkenes. Okay. Let me even start writing now. Oh yeah. Whoops. I So you started talking about alkenes, right? And oh, you know what alkenes are. They're just double bonds, right? We've spent the past few weeks just sitting here thinking about how to make them, right? So you make them by E2 or E1. Okay, you know how to do that, right? That's if you have like a, a bromine or if you have an alcohol, Right, you, you know how to do that. Um, yeah, this is old stuff, okay. And now we, okay, you have alkenes, right? And we spent all this work. In fact, we spent like three weeks talking about how to make these things. Well, now we get to actually use them and do something with them. We get to do a whole lot with them, like a ton of, of stuff to do with them. Um, yeah, and so, well, we did this and that's cool, right? But now we can actually do reactions. So, well, that's what we talk about. Okay. And I don't know, I, was, I sat here for a while thinking about like, oh, what's the what's like the best way to talk about this? What's like a really good way? Um, and I guess the like the most classic way is just to actually, well, write out what the reactions are, because there's so many of them that now and really from this point on in the course, this is where it becomes about like, keeping track of what's going on. There's so much information that sometimes it can be hard to remember what reactions you've learned. So this is kind of the time where it starts to get good to, to go back through and remind ourselves of what we've seen. Okay. So in terms of alkenes, what we're going to be doing are primarily additions. Okay meaning that we go from a double bond to a single bond. We take this double bond and we add some stuff, right? And then it becomes, I don't know, X and Y, right? We add, we add stuff, whatever you, whatever you want to choose. Um, this is contrasted to, there's a few reactions that you learned in this section, which are, uh, which are not additions. They're actually how you break double bonds, which is the first time that you're able to really break carbon carbon bonds, which is kind of cool and exciting. Um, in fact, it's pretty interesting, but uh, we'll get to those in, in a second. So, okay, there's addition reactions and there's a lot of different ways to break these up. So, well, we'll just pick one and, and go with it. Um, and it's, it's always good practice to think of other ways that you can think of how to list these things. But the way that we'll talk about it is whether you add. So well, when you do this, you'll, you have to add things to eat to both sides, right? But one of them could be hydrogen, or zero of them could be hydrogen, or both of them could be hydrogen. Right? So if we add like, so well, if we're adding two hydrogens,
well, there's, I mean, there's not much we can do, right? There we go. You're adding two hydrogens. And what do, what do we actually use to do this? You can use uh, H2 and a metal catalyst. Yeah. What's your favorite metal catalyst? Palladium. Yeah, palladium. What's another? Platinum. Sure, platinum. Yeah. And then, well, there's a third. Uh, nickel. Yeah, nickel. Right. Um, yeah, so you could, use, you could use either of these three, whichever is your choice. My recommendation is always just pick one and remember it. Platinum is probably the good choice, or palladium, either one of those two. Nickel doesn't show up as often, so don't use, don't use, don't. Feel free to not remember nickel, but uh, platinum or palladium, just remember one of those and, and you're fine. Okay, all right, cool. And that, that's all that you could do, right? That's that's it. This is the, the whole extent of this reaction, right? If you're adding two hydrogens, well, there's one reaction to do it, and this is it, okay? So now if we add one hydrogen, Plus, I don't know, one interesting thing. Well, now, okay, there's a whole lot more. Okay. So if we're going from this to, I don't know, there's a lot of things. So, well, what's one reaction where we do an addition on alkene and we get one hydrogen and one of something else. Oxymercuration, demercuration. Oh, wow, we're hitting heavy first. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, so oxymercuration, de uh, demercuration. So for now, I'll just write OMDM because we'll talk about what the reagents are later or ah, whatever. No, we'll talk about it now. Okay. Uh, yeah. So with oxymercuration, demercuration, this is a two-step reaction, right? So first we add so uh, mercury acetate, which is this HgOAC2. And then we also add water. Okay. Why don't I even be a little bit more general? Because nobody says it has to be water. Okay. We can even make it an alcohol. That R could be a, could be an H, in which case it's just water, but we'll be we'll be even more general, right? Anybody remember the second step? NADH four. Yeah. Yeah. Also known as sodium borohydride. Okay. And great, we get an alcohol. And okay, I've been showing this as this compound, but why don't I, I'll make it more interesting just in general and we'll use this instead. So that alcohol goes onto the more substituted carbon. So what orientation is this called? More cosmical. Yeah. Oh, geez. All right. Uh, yeah, so this is Markovnikov, right? Meaning that it goes on to the more substituted carbon. Okay. This is not the only Markovnikov hydration that we have. Okay. What is the other one? We could do the same thing in a different way. Ideas. Is it hydration? Mm -hmm. What do we use for that? Like uh, dilute acid. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, right. Yeah, this is the thing that I tried beating you over the head with. Uh, this, you learned this before. You learned this because it's E1. It's just in the other direction. Okay. So yeah, you could do this hydration in this way too. Um, 
the question is then why do we put in all of this effort to do oxymercuration demercuration like what is the point of using all this complicated stuff if we could just give it like dilute acid does anybody remember is it just that you don't want e1 to happen like a little bit or does that not really matter mm, well we're starting with the alkane so in jet yeah you're, so you have a point that this would get more messy because well you could do e1 in different spots right like here you you could also get something that would look like this right and that's like ugly but there's kind of a there's a bigger reason which is related to the fact that things get messy when you do this but things can get really messy does it have to do with rearrangements yeah exactly right so this gets rearrangements okay because you have a carbocation but over here you have no carbocation so this is a really important like mechanism that this follows so the way that this works is that this these electrons from the double bond i mean there's a lot of electrons here right it's a whole double bond so they'll come over here and they'll pop off one of these one of these guys um and you wind up forming this triangular complex which is like a real theme for here for this um once you get these triangular complexes there's like a whole bunch of stuff you can do right and the kind of idea is and this is like a well okay uh anyway once you're here right from there you have you have water and this water could attack this carbon or this carbon over here because this is a nucleophile and this is like a positively charged area or at least this positive charge kind of like affects these carbons and, and so okay it's going to attack one of these two right um the question is like which of these two it attacks and this determines whether it's a markovnikov or anti-markovnikov addition so the way that uh my professor for orgo two taught us how to do it and this is like the sketchiest thing on the planet this is like totally fake news but uh what you could do is kind of just like you can you can sort of treat this as being like an equilibrium thing except it's not well, anyway uh <laughs> see what i mean so so you could do you could write it like this right and then you can kind of this is just how you could think about it this is not actually like what happens but you could write you could like break and make the bonds so you can have like a plus charge over here or the other way you could do it is to break the other bond oops not over there okay so you can kind of think about it being like this and well this is going to be the best of those three this is going to be like the best form so when you have water it's going to attack this carbon instead of the other one. Okay. This is like a, a kind of like crappy way to think about it because this is like, this is totally not what actually happens, but um, I don't know. It, it was like a useful trick that I, I've used before just because um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's like simple to think about it, right? It, it kind of takes out the effort of, you need to think every time. Yeah. So, so this is one way you could think about it, but by no means do you have to. Um, anyway, the, the important point is that with this mechanism, let me, let me get rid of this stuff. Yeah. So the important point is with this mechanism, this thing is this uh, water or the alcohol, whatever you're using, is going to attack the thing that's a more stable carbocation. And so from there, you get to here, right? You could deprotonate this water. I don't need to tell you how to do that. And then sodium borohydride, 
right? And we usually don't write out the step of the mechanism, but you can effectively treat you could effectively treat this as like an H minus, which is just gonna come and kick this thing off. Okay. But we usually don't write that out. Um, oh, okay. Uh, instead, what just happens is we finish off like that. So this is the mechanism and I didn't have to use this uh, sodium or mercury acetate, right? We could have chosen something else. So, well, these are, yeah, so this is the mechanism, right? And these are two of the, the reactions that we could have done. Well, what else could we do with this mechanism? What other reaction does this sort of thing where you make this this triangle with uh, with a plus charge? The halogenation reactions? Yeah. Right. So well, we could use two halogens, and I guess I said earlier that this is only one hydrogen and one interesting thing. So right, whatever. Uh, We'll use HX instead, but use HX and well, this is going to be the same sort of way, right? If this is also going to be Markovnikov. I'll just label it M because this is like the longest name on, on the planet. Okay. What if we don't want to make it Markovnikov? Is there another way that we could do this? The one that involves radicals. Exactly. The difference being that here we write that we're using ultraviolet light. And there we go. Look. Oh my God. That was ugly. Okay. And now we have an anti Markovnikov addition. And this is pretty nice because, well, with everything that we've had till this point, we can only really work with the most substituted carbon. Nothing really uses the least substituted carbon. And now we can flip that. Which is good. Adam, for that one, do we need to include like the peroxides? Oh, you're right. Yeah. So this reaction uses normally some some peroxide. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't just need light. It needs a peroxide too. Thank you. Um, yeah. Okay. And. Well, you already know the mechanism for this one because it was the first reaction that you learned in the class, which is free radical, in this case, not exactly halogenation, but it still follows the same initiation, uh, termination, propagation, not in that order, but yeah, still follows that. Cool. Um, good. So this is how we add a halogen, right? And then there's like one, yeah, I guess when I think about it, there's really only one like other really big reaction that does, uh, that adds like one hydrogen and one other thing. And it makes an alcohol. So we talked about how to make Markovnikov alcohols, but we didn't talk about how to make them anti-Markovnikov. So, what reaction do we do use to do this? Hydroboration oxidation. Yeah, exactly. So here we use BH3 and typically the pen professors at least like to write BH3.THF. Uh, there's this whole stuff about how BH3 will like dimerize if you just leave it alone. So you have to like couple it to TH. It's not that important. Um, so, okay. Yeah. We have BH3.THF. We add that, right? And then what is step two? What do we add? Does anybody remember? There's a whole bunch of stuff. 
H202 and NAH. Yeah. NaOH. Right. And then sometimes people will also write water here because, well, you have to dissolve it in something, but that's kind of, you can assume that there's water here. Um, yeah. I have a question about this particular reaction. So um, Professor Molander never actually went over like the mechanism for the second, like the oxidation step. So I was wondering if you could maybe go over that. Mm, yeah. Uh, so I was actually going to comment on this. Um, at least I know when, when I've taken the class and just typically they haven't asked about the mechanism very much. I think you're like technically expected to know it, but in general, they haven't asked about it very much. Um, yeah, I wouldn't, I also wouldn't expect them to ask you about it because, well, you could just look it up, right? And they're not, they're not going to ask you questions that you could just look up. But uh, anyway, um, the, the whole point is the mechanism for hydroboration is really complicated, right? But the, the kind of key and important point is that when you start it, the boron like sits on, on the top, right? So it sits like this. Um, and it does so because this boron is actually, I think it's less electronegative than the hydrogen or, or one of those two, right? So this hydrogen is actually a negative charge and this boron is like more positive, right? But this tertiary carbon here is like more positive and more negative. So opposites attract in this case, right? And they just kind of sit down like this. H2 and then hydrogen. And this is kind of like the whole start of it. Um, and if you really want, this is how you could remember it's anti-Markovnikov, but well, probably easier to just keep that in mind um, because this is like a very special reaction. Okay, and then you do a whole bunch of other stuff, right? Um, and when it comes to the ox oxidation, I haven't seen it in a while, so um, I think there's, I think the, the way that this mechanism goes is that you wind up getting to something that looks like this. Let's see, that's four bonds. Okay. That's okay. Um, yeah, no, no, no. It's yeah. I think, I think this is where, where you get, um, Yeah, and then yeah, uh, I don't know. I so I can't. Yeah, I, I mean, I honestly I can't exactly remember. It's um, the mechanism for hydroboration is like very long and very specific, um, and there's not that. It's not very frequent that I've seen it. Um, why don't I actually pull it up and I can. And talk through it. Um, let's see. It is. Oh, incredible! The book doesn't have it either. Okay. Um, I don't know. I could I could pull it up pull it up later and and talk about it at the end. Um. Yeah, there's, there's these whole bunch of steps. And then in this is also kind of just like a general thing. Um, a lot of the time in mechanisms when there will be like an oxidation step, it's just like, oh, you do an oxidation and, th and that's the end. Um, it usually isn't actually shown what, what they do. Um, yeah. So is the OH group that attaches to like the less substituted center, is it is the OH from the peroxide or the base? Uh, it winds up being from the peroxide. Okay. Yeah. So so uh, what definitely does happen, uh, and this part of the mechanism I, I remember. <laughs> um, so you get. Right, you have this hydrogen peroxide and the base will come in and 
actually deprotonate this peroxide, which is like super weird, but you have this OOH minus, and this is actually what attaches to the boron. So, uh, so you wind up getting like B O O H. The plus charge here, right? And then what what does happen is that there's this weird thing where, uh, I think it's like these electrons go over here because they attach. Mm, no, no, that's not it. so. I think they come over here and then this thing like moves over here. It's something kind of complicated like this, but what you do wind up getting is uh, yeah. So you get it, you get the oxygen and then the BH2 OH and then all this right, extra stuff. Um, yeah, this, this is kind of complicated. It's, it's good to know. Um, it's good to know this mechanism. I think at a lot of other like universities and colleges, this is like a kind of standard question. Like they'll always ask like, oh, draw out the hydroboration mechanism. And then typically at Penn, they haven't. I think there's been like one case in the past where they have, and it kind of came out of nowhere and it was worth like a few points, but um, it was not like, it was like a kind of rare thing. And they were also just being really mean, so. Yeah, but you know how that goes. Um, yeah, yeah. I, so I can't remember exactly about this oxidation stuff, but we can we can look at it later. Anyway, um, this is all to say that of the reactions, if you're sitting there and you're really like going through mechanisms and you're like trying to really remember uh, and study them. Um, Hydroboration is not like a, a really key mechanism, uh, at least for this class, they tend to, not to ask about it very much. Anyway, yeah, cool. So these are kind of the main reactions that you could do where you're adding like one hydrogen and one of something else, it's, it's these. Um, and then now if you're adding two things, Okay, well, we kind of already said one, which is if you have this and you're adding two of a halogen, well, there you go. It's not that interesting. You just add two of that halogen, okay? And the mechanism of this, exactly the same as what we had before, right? So we have this, this bromine up at the top and then a BR minus attacks from below. Should there be X's instead of bromines on the right thing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there should be. Uh, bromines is the most common, but yeah. Um, actually, in fact, I even should have drawn this a little bit less carelessly um, because it should be anti-addition. Because stereochemistry here does does matter. Okay. And well, we don't have to just use two halogens. For example, there's another interesting kind of reaction where we can use two of a halogen and something else. Anybody remember what reaction? or have an idea about what reaction I'm talking about, because that was kind of vague. If you use water, is it that like hollow hydrogen reaction? Exactly. Yeah. So we could use water here instead. And what happens is we wind up getting the halogen on the less substituted carbon and the alcohol on the more substituted carbon. Like that. Okay. And the reason for that, well, of course, it's because it follows the same mechanism, right? So, 
my structures are really messy today. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so we put this halogen up here, right? This is called a, uh, well, in the case of bromine, this is called bromonium when it does this. But otherwise, I don't, we don't really call it anything. Okay. And what happens is there's so much water floating around because, well, if you're doing this in water, I mean, water is really easy to get, right? So there's a ton of it floating around and way less bromine. So the water is just going to outcompete the bromine and it's going to attack instead. Okay. And again, it's going to attack whichever carbon is more substituted because that's the one that holds the positive charge better. And there you go. So that is that. Okay. And well, there's also we could also add two alcohols, right? And so there's well, there's a few ways of doing this. So one way that we could do it is to get syn dihydroxylation. And then the alternate is that we can get anti-dihydroxylation. Oh, wow. Well, I had it right the first time. Okay, yeah. We can get anti-dihydroxylation. Okay. So if we want to get sin, what is something that we could use? You could use OSO4 and then H2O2. Exactly, yeah. So that's a, that's a good option. In fact, that's a really good option. Um, and that reactant works very well. There's a reason that we don't use it though, um, which doesn't actually apply to, to the class organic chemistry, but when it comes to like actually doing organic chemistry in the real, real world, world uh, osmium tetroxide is super expensive. So they don't use it. Um, Osmium is like a really uncommon metal, but yeah. Anyway, so you could use that, or there's another option, which is way cheaper, although not as good, which is what? Permanganate. Yeah. Yeah, so you could use cold, dilute, potassium permanganate. Yeah, and if I remember correctly, you need a base here as well. Well, you need so you need hydroxide as well. Why does it have to be cold? Yeah, so I, I specified cold and dilute, and it needs to be both of those things because uh, because otherwise you'll get a different reaction, which well, well actually mentioned down here, which is uh, so if you want to do. Well, these are all the, the reactions where you add two different things. Uh, oh, no, I guess there's a couple more. Anyway, uh, we'll go down here. So there's also cleavage reactions. And what happens in these cases is that you actually break the double bond. And you, you break it all the way, like totally. You, you break straight down the middle, and you get two separate molecules out. And so if you use potassium permanganate, uh, and it's in general here, if it's concentrated and hot, what happens is that you get two carboxylic acids. Oh, or a ketone. So it splits down the middle here. Oops. Yeah. What really happens is potassium permanganate is like super ox. It's like a really, really good oxidative. Uh, oxidizing agent. And so if it's not cold and if it's not dilute, then it's going to be too strong and it's just going to do this reaction instead. Or some mess of other things too. But uh, generally, it'll just do this instead. So whenever you, if you choose to use pot uh, potassium permanganate to do syn dihydroxylation, well, you should be sure that you specify that it should be cold and dilute. Because otherwise, well, it'll, it'll go out of control. Yeah. 
So that's if we want to do syn dihydroxylation. And then there's a way to do anti, but maybe instead of going straight there, because it's not like a one step thing, what we could do is take this and make a precursor, which is this guy. Okay. Does anybody remember what this is called? Epoxide. Exactly. Yeah. And you will be seeing a lot of these, a whole ton of them, like more than you will ever want to see. Uh, epoxides are super useful. And that also means that, well, organic chemistry professors love to ask about them because they're also kind of tricky. So you'll be seeing plenty of these. What do you use to make an epoxide? There's like one thing that's always used. Carbene. What is it? Carbene, like a carbon with two bonds and two electrons. Uh, so you use that to make, so you could use that, but uh, not for an epoxide. So for, if you want to make, and this is good because we had to talk about this one anyway. So if you want to make just a carbon, like a, a three carbon ring, then you could use a carbene. And so the way that you do that is with CH2, I2 and zinc. So this is called the Simmons Smith reaction. Um, and that's one, that's one thing that you could do. But if you want to make an epoxide, there's an easier way to do it, which is uh, with MCPBA. Exactly. Yeah. So you use MCPBA. Uh, people write it differently all the time. I think this is like the proper way of doing it, but it doesn't make a huge deal. I mean, it doesn't make a huge difference. Yeah. Uh, so use MCPVA. And I don't know, I, they could ask about the mechanism. It's kind of neat, but like, they don't tend to. Um, and they probably won't for you either, because it's, it is just the thing that you could look up. Right. So if you have this, uh, MCPVA has like this structure. And then there's some extra stuff down here. It doesn't matter. It's, it's, it has to be a peroxy acid like this, but otherwise it doesn't really make a difference what it is. And then the mechanism is pretty cool. It, like you like grab this thing and then this oxygen pulls this hydrogen. Um, actually, I think it's, I think it's that this, this bond goes to this oxygen and then this guy goes over here and this comes down here or something, something along these lines. Um, and it happens in all one step and you only need one reagent, which is what makes this like such a nice reaction because all you have to do is write MCPVA. You don't have to deal with any other, other junk. You don't have to write other stuff. Um, it's, it's a one step thing, no rearrangement, nothing, right? You have a double bond, you can make it into an epoxide, no problem. So that's super, super nice. And we could use epoxides for a lot of stuff, which is good. Oh, and there's these cleavage reactions. Well, why don't I use my super advanced skills that I now have? Um, I'll actually just move these. There's one more reaction, uh, which is really similar to this, but if we want, the Simmons-Smith reaction is pretty hard, but what's a lot easier is if we wanna make this triangle and it has two bromines. I think you can do this with like chlorines or iodines too, but bromines are way easier. Um, and well, this, this is not that interesting. I'll just tell you. So it's, uh, you can add bromoform, which is CHBr3, and then, uh, you need some base too. So you need like sodium hydroxide to do that. This is random, but I've been wondering if like writing things above or below the arrow does that mean something like you wrote ch2i2 slash zinc both above but like some things write one above one below oh no it doesn't make a difference okay. um yeah it doesn't matter it does when you write like step one something step two something um but otherwise it's it's just like what fits where yeah otherwise it's not it doesn't make a difference This is, a, this is another option that we have. This is like really specific. If you ever see a carbon with like these two bromines on it 
and it's in a three carbon ring, this is the only reaction that you could do to get there. Um, it's just one of these things that's like super specific. Same with the Simmons-Smith reaction, this one up here. Um, it's, it's just really specific and, and it's not that interesting really because it's just like, do you know the, the reagents for it? Um, yeah, if you had a CH2I2 and then you combine it with an NaOH, then you would get an H and an I on top, right? So it wouldn't work. It had uh, this thing has to have three halogens on it. Mm -hmm. um, it it's kind of like the reason why is a little bit specific. So like when you have um, when you have like this thing. Um, it's yeah if i remember correctly this is like these bromines make this carbon really acidic um i think yeah that, that might that might not be exactly right but but the idea is that like uh the oh is able to pull this hydrogen off oh yeah yeah that is, that is exactly it actually um and so you get these three bromines And a minus charge here and then one of these bromines comes off um i think it actually just leaves uh and then you get a carbine i see because like in the textbook there were a couple of problems that mixed the ch2 and then like halide like x2 and then they put it with the naoh and then it gave us like the hbr with the triangle ring so yeah, I was wondering. Oh, it did. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. I mean, follow follow what the textbook says, uh, mm -hmm. because well, you could always just fall back on the textbook if they ever if like the professor or the graders always say like if they ever mm -hmm. say like, oh, you're wrong. Um, yeah. So so when I I know when I learned this, it was uh, there was this idea that like you kind of only pass that like this thing only becomes acidic enough once you get three halogens on there because they're so electronegative and they like with two halogens is not really going to work very well but but it might be possible that uh the thing is this thing is not very acidic with two hydrogens but it's acidic enough like you could still do it so i could see that happening um i just well i haven't i haven't seen it before so i i wasn't i wouldn't expect that but um, yeah, I guess they can do it. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this is this thing. I don't know. They could, I guess they could ask about the mechanism. I just don't see them really asking about like, oh, do you know the reaction mechanism for this thing? Because like, well, you know, somebody would just look it up probably, even though, I mean, you're not supposed to, but well class of like 500 people so yeah um so i don't i don't see them asking about that sort of thing it's weird because i'm not like entirely sure what they'll ask about in terms of mechanisms for this year as opposed to like a usual year um but yeah anyway this is like a really specific reaction um it comes up again like way down the line sort of in some sense but um you're not going to see that for a while Okay, yeah, and then there's only really one other reaction left, right? And so in terms of cleavage, there's one other one, which is also super specific. And this one, I've never seen them ask them for the mechanism of, um, just because, well, it's, it's all, this is also a, a, like the sort of thing that's classic for them to ask about at other schools or universities, but like Penn doesn't, they don't really care about it that much because it is kind of just a memorization thing. Um, but if you add this ozone for one thing, well, this reaction is ozonolysis. Um, so if you add ozone and then you add another reagent, what's the other reagent? Something with the sulfur. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, it's dimethyl sulfur, 
for dimethyl sulfide. Oh, so I wrote MESS, no, ME2S. Um, yeah, so if you use dimethyl sulfide, what you get is aldehydes instead of acids and ketones, but well, that's no different. Okay, so this makes acids and this makes aldehydes. Okay, but there's something that people don't tell you that often, which is that you could use ozonolysis to make acids too. So this is a reductive, reductive workup. Okay, but you could also just use ozone and then you could use uh, hydrogen peroxide and it'll give you acid as well. And this one, so this one is oxidative workup. So this is another choice that you have. And I, I've seen this come up before and I don't remember them ever talking about it in the class, but like somehow I think you're just kind of expected to pick up on it. Um, yeah, so I've, I've, seen, I've seen this come up before and uh, it's, it's like good, just one of those things that's good to know, I guess, but. Would the product look just like the one like for the other cleavage reaction? Yep, same thing as this. Yeah, so this is another option, but uh, yeah. Excellent. And that's it. All right. Yeah, we've talked about all of them. Okay. Um, there's a lot of them, right? This is a big list. Let's, I mean, let's look at this whole thing, right? Look at all of these. Yeah, that's a lot of reactions to remember. So, so uh, we talked about it in terms of this weird way of how, like, how many hydrogens you stick on or like how many of whatever you're putting on. Um, that's one way to think about it. I don't know, that's kind of weird. I was trying to be creative or something. Uh, there's There are other ways to, to look at it or think about it, right? You could think about what makes an alcohol and what makes something else. Um, you think about what is Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov, at least, at least when it comes to these, these reactions here in the middle. Um, you could think about those. Yeah. Uh, and in general, just being just kind of going through them again and and remembering what all of the different types of reactions are, um, that that will be helpful because now that you're getting a lot of different reactions, it'll be useful to remember what you actually learned and what you've seen. All right. Anyway, why don't we do some problems? Oops. Um, There we go. Okay. So oops. let me let me pull up one of these problems. Let's do it. Um here we go. So this is a synthesis problem. So we're starting out good. Um, here we go. Let's add this. Yeah. Um, so it's asking, okay, let's say you're starting with this compound up at the top. That's kind of weird and complicated. Um, and asking, well, how would you make all the rest of these? So let's think about it. We have this alkene, alkene here. Um, and then a whole bunch of other stuff. And well, fortunately, that whole bunch of other stuff probably isn't going to be super interesting for us, right? Um, so we could really just just work with this alkene and kind of not not think so much about the rest. Okay. So the first question is how we would make this guy here. Okay. And well, this is where I hand it off to all of you. Um, because well, we've just talked about all the different reactions that you could do. So hopefully you're up to date on them and you're able to keep track of what's going on. Um, so I guess the question is what, I mean, any, any ideas what we could do here? Because this is like, there are gonna be a couple of steps to the synthesis. So like, what are we, 
Well, what could we do? Could we make an epoxide and then open it up using like the something with the CH2 and the phenol? Okay. Uh, so let's say we were to make an epoxide here, which is always a good uh, good thing, thing to ask yourself. So let's say we make this epoxide. Okay, and let's draw out this whole thing. Oops. Um, whatever, there's this whole junk, it doesn't matter. Okay, and we make an epoxide. Okay. Um, so how do you want to open this epoxide? You know, in my head, I somehow had it uh, so that we would get to get the oxygen to be a nucleophile, but now I'm not sure actually. Yeah, yeah, it would come out weird. Um, and the thing with epoxides is that they're really good if you want to have two alcohols. Or well, some other stuff, but for now, just two alcohols, right? So if we wanted to open this up, what we would probably want to do is have like, I don't know, something come in here, right? We would need something with a minus charge. I don't know, whatever, whatever thing you want to choose, a nucleophile. Uh, something with a minus charge to come in here and, and open this epoxide. But well, the only thing that's on this side is an extra hydrogen. And so we, we don't really have a nice way of adding a hydrogen as a nucleophile. Hydrogen, like hydride is a garbage nucleophile. Okay. Yeah. So, well, we don't want to, that would just get messy. Okay. Epoxide is not going to work. Okay. Other options? I think that the well, one of the final steps would be a alkyl oxymercuration, I guess. Um, but the first step, I guess that is a Mark, that, that's like a Markovnikov uh, addition. So we could use, um, we could just use like HBr, I guess. And then it would turn the right side of that, well, one of those into like a CH3, we'll put a BR right there. And then we could do the alkoxyl mercury creation. And then we would end up with that ether and then another H. Yeah, so uh, we actually don't even have to do that. We don't even have to add the HBR. Um, what, you, what you said right away was, was, was the right step to begin with. Um, you actually could do this in one one step. So if you use alkoxy mercuration, the longest word on the planet, and demercuration, the second longest word on the planet. Um, if you use alkoxy mercuration and demercuration, you could do this in a in a single step. Why? Well, we're taking. Remember what we had earlier, we had something like this, and then we have mercury acetate and this thing, right? And then whatever our other step was, which is sodium borohydride, right? And we were able to add an alcohol to the more substituted side. Or sorry, I should say an ether to the more substituted side, right? That's exactly what we're doing here. It's no different. Okay. So, well, we could do this in a single step. Well, two step reaction, but we just write it as one. Um, so, our alcohol is going to be. We could basically just copy what what's over here, right? And well, we also need this mercury acetate, right? Okay, and second step, sodium borohydride, and you're done, that's it. Pretty 
pretty nice, huh? Yeah. Um, are there other ways of doing it? Would this be like a valid way to, of thinking about it? What do you like um, do you like a Markovnikov like addition of just like alcohol and um, like hydrogen to get like an alcohol um, at like the more substituted place and then could you deprotonate that alcohol to make a nucleophile and then use that to like um, like attack some like carbon thing? Yeah, that would actually work really well. Um, so when I, when I saw this problem at first, that was, uh, that was actually what I thought right away, just because, um, I don't know, for me, at least I, I always found it hard to remember about alco uh, alkoxymercuration, demercuration. It's kind of like a, like, it's really nice when you can use it as a trick to like do stuff in one step, but I always just forgot about it and, and did stuff a different way. Um, so yeah, you're, you're totally right. Um, you could actually do this instead, which is that, okay, you have all this stuff, this doesn't matter, whatever, right? So you take this, okay, and you can add your alcohol, well, however you want. So simplest way is just going to be to hydrate it. Um, in this case, hydration is fine because, well, you're not going to get rearrangements here. It's already going to be a tertiary carbocation. That's as good as it gets. Right. I, there, people will still say that you don't want to use uh, hydration like this just because it's still like it doesn't go to completion. And in, even with carbocations, like even when you, rearrangements aren't likely to happen, you still just don't. This is like not the preferred way of doing it. Anyway, um, so you could do this and then you could deprotonate. And a really good way of deprotonating is sodium hydride because, well, that's like what it's best for. If you used a base, like a really good base, well, it would probably deprotonate this too anyway. So it doesn't really matter that much what you use. But anyway, yeah, you'd get this O minus, right? This is a pretty good. Uh, you would use this as a nuclear file. It's huge, right? This whole thing is massive. And so it'll be a really bulky nuclear file, but whatever, right? From there. There we go. Add this. This is really good for SM2, isn't it? It's a benzylic bromide. It's fantastic. So there we go. And then product. So that's another option um, that you could do. Yeah, you do this too. The this way is preferred, definitely because it's one step, right? Uh, you do you have just have to do one reaction and that's it. And so you don't have to do all this like extra stuff about like I don't know. You don't you don't have to do. You don't have to do all this extra stuff, right? But but whatever. Um, there's another way to do it. This is actually called the Williamson ether synthesis, by the way, in case in case you're keeping track. But not a huge deal. You'll see it again, so don't worry about remembering it now. Yeah, this is another option. Uh, there's there's actually even you could do extra stuff too. You could probably do SN one. Although if you if you wrote down SN one for this at this point, they would start docking points because um, SN one is just generally a bad reaction. So you don't you don't want to do it. Um, yeah. Okay. What about B? Any thoughts? We have this iodine here, which is a real pain. So what do we think? Well, maybe I'll ask this another way. How do we know how to attach an iodine? Because I can only think of one way. Do 
a SN2 reaction. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, okay, we'll, we're going through retrosynthetic analysis now because, uh, well, it's not immediately clear how to start from here and, and get to this product. At least it's not for me. Uh, if it is for you, well, you're doing something, right? Um, yeah, okay, so we could do SN2, right? In fact, it's an allylic iodine here. So whatever we had on there would work really well for SN2. Right. And then, okay, here's some leaving group. I don't know what it is, right? But maybe by this point, someone's able to see what leaving group we should use. Bromination with MBS, so bromine can leave. Yeah, exactly. Right. So here we go. We going backwards. We can get back to the starting thing. Like this, having brominated, right? So we could do NBS, right? Not BR2 because you now know what BR2 does when it's in the presence of a double bond, right? So it has to be NBS, it can't be BR2 because we're doing allylic bromination, right? Well, we can now replace this, this LG with what we actually know it's gonna be. So it's gonna be a bromine. And then, well, what's, what's a reagent that we would use for iodine, uh, attaching an iodine? What reaction conditions would we use? Uh, could we just put it in a, a polar aprotic solution? Yeah, so you could put this in a polar aprotic thing. Acetone is a really easy and useful solvent. Um, you could pick a different solvent, it's your choice, right? And then, I don't know, something with an iodine on it, right? Most common thing you'll see is potassium iodide. Nice and easy. Okay. Excellent. Let's look at C. Oh, look at that. We made a triangle. Okay, what reaction is this? <laughs> Not that much to say about it. Is it the like Simmons Smith one? Yeah, exactly. Right. And what reagents does it use? Uh, CH2I2 and zinc. Exactly. CH2I2, zinc, you're done. That's it. Okay. You can draw this thing out again just to eat up time. Uh, yeah. That is it, right? This is one of those cases where like, you see this, this triangle here, right? There's one reaction that does it. If you turn the double bond into a triangle, that's, that's your one choice. It's your one option. Okay. So not much to say about that one. It's not that interesting. Um, I think you, I think the lectures do have the mechanism for the Simon Smith reaction. If you really want to like, Look at that. You might, they might want you to know it. I don't think so. It has to do with like coordination between the CH2I2 and the zinc and it does some stuff like that. So you made like an, a hexagon into some like really weird looking chair thing with the double bond in the middle. Oh, really? Okay. I, I, uh, I remember that somehow the zinc swaps in for the iodine and does something along those lines, but it's, uh, what, what I can't say in general, whenever there's like a metal involved in a reaction, at least when it's like a case like this, where it's a catalyst, um, they usually don't expect you to know the reaction, the mechanism, because catalysts are just like really complicated, <laughs> basically. Um, yeah, it's like a weird mechanism thing. Um, 
besides this is one case where like again they wouldn't they probably wouldn't ask for a mechanism with something like this because well it's just about did you memorize it or not and that's that's not interesting right it doesn't there's no point in asking that as much as this class is about memorization there are some things that that they don't want you to memorize or there's no point in it but nice here we go oh yeah we got more synthesis problems um here we go let's see actually why don't i just pull them up one at a time So here we go. Here's the synthesis question that's asking how you would make this. You would go from here to uh, from here to here. Yeah. Okay. So taking a look at this. Well, why don't I ask this first? Um, look at this compound over here. What what can you do to it? What options are there? Brominate. <clears throat> brominate. Yeah, there's one option. One thing you could do and is brominate. Okay. That is it. Okay. It doesn't matter where the bromine is going to go. There's the, you can only do one thing, right? So the only thing that you could do is stick a bromine on there. Okay, well, that's not really where we want it. So we're gonna have to do some extra work, right? Um, yeah. Now, now it's up to you guys. What do we do? You could do an elimination reaction um, with a small, strong base to form the thing set product. And then after that, you could just do HBR with R O O R to get the um, the anti Markovnikov product. And light. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I that that works perfectly well. Um, Exactly. You got it. So perfect. Uh, I don't know. There's not much more for me to say about it than that. Um, I, I guess what I can say is that's one option and this is totally good. This is, this is uh, as good of a, a pathway as you can take. In fact, yeah, this is actually probably the best one. Um, yeah. The thing that I was thinking which takes more steps so this is better but uh what i had thought was you could use o terbutyl for example some big bulky base get up to here use nbs to do allylic bromination and then hydrogenate it So it's another option. It's another way that you could do it, but well, yeah, chance of your method was actually better. So go with that one instead. Yeah, uh, the, the way that I just said, uh, it takes an extra step. Like you have to do, you have to do one more step in it and the fewer steps, the better in general, so. Yeah, I actually, uh, whoops. whoops, oh man, uh, so this way is actually better. Yeah, yeah, let me, let me pull up the next one. Okay, here we go. Okay. 
So we're going from the starting compound over to this thing. And well, what do you notice about the final structure? What did I just circle? Or in other words, how are we going to make this final structure? CHBr3 and NaOH. Yeah, CHCl. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Um, and then NaOH, yeah, exactly, right. Um, yeah, you could do this with chlorine too. It, it's the same same style of reaction, right? There's a triangle and there's two halogens on it. Uh, hopefully this should just scream this reaction. I don't remember if this reaction has a name, but. Um, How do you get to pick where the triangle happens? Exactly. So in this case, we have to go, we have to go backwards a step, right? And think about where the double bond is going to be. So we know that this triangle happens on a double bond. So we're going to need one over here. And the rest of this question is how do we make this double bond and not any other double bond? Exactly. So, okay, let's look at what we actually started with. And well, what can we do with this compound? There's only one option. Again, maybe I'll save you from unmuting and saying it because. Bromonate. Yeah, yeah, you already know. Uh, yeah, it's bromonate, right? Um, so you bromonate, and then you get a bromine right here, right? Okay, and now now we have to eliminate to make a double bond because well, that's how we know how to make double bonds. Um, and what do we use? A smaller bulky base. Small. Yeah, exactly. A small base, right? And nobody's asking you to be creative, so sodium hydroxide works perfectly fine. Okay. If somebody is asking you to be creative, which, well, they won't, but you would use sodium methoxide too. Why not? another option. Yeah. yeah, this one, I don't think there are any alternate possibilities. I'm pretty sure it's just this. I, I, uh, I can't think of any other ways to do this. Is there like a particular name for this? Because I don't even remember him teaching us this <laughs> uh what th this reaction yeah that one uh i can't remember if there's a react if there's a name for it um it could have to do with the, f the if there is a name for it it would have to do with either the fact that it has um that it uses a carbene so that's one thing that's kind of interesting. Uh, the, a carbene being, it uses this thing to react. Um, this is a carbene. Um, yeah, or the, there's also the fact that this, this is, uh, it's called chloroform which some of you might recognize as a kidnapper's sedative of choice. Um, but I don't know if, I don't know if this has a name. Actually, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm pulling it up. I, uh, I don't. We talked about this under the carbene sections and there was no name for it. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think I've seen any, I don't think I've seen anything for it. Um, Oh, so, oh, okay. So in the, I mean, in the book, they say it, it falls under alpha elimination. Um, alpha elimination just refers to the fact that you're pulling this hydrogen off, or or that you're pulling one of these chlorines off. I can't, I can't remember exactly which of the two it refers to. Um, yeah, actually, it probably it's probably more about the fact that you're pulling one of these chlorines off. But um, yeah, it's not a huge deal. Alpha elimination is just part of the mechanism for it it's not the actual whole reaction um so i don't i don't know what it would be called yeah he probably i imagine during the lectures he just like kind of 
point of this reaction out and then and then moved on because I, there's not too much that's super interesting to say. Um, I know in the past that they they would cover the mechanism for this reaction too, um, because this is like the one place that you do see an alpha elimination mechanism, but it's not um, not super engaging unless you go on to like higher organic chemistry stuff and and well. Just All right, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the fortunate thing about this reaction is that it's it's just, um, it's kind of just one of these, if you see it, you know, you know what, what you're gonna do things. Um, yeah. Cool, why don't I, um, why don't I get this next thing up? Oh yeah. Copy and paste. Oh, look, it's right on top of the old one. Okay. Um, here we go. All right, so we're starting with this, uh, this bromine, and we're, we're trying to go over here to the end, right? And well, what do you notice about these two alcohols? I was saying, oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. It was like a symphony of three people saying sin all at the same time. Yeah, so uh, looking backwards, this is going to be sin dihydro, whatever, right? Dihydroxylation. Um, maybe the third longest word on in the dictionary right uh dihydroxylation so okay yeah so we're gonna do that right and if we want to do syn dihydroxylation well we need an alkene there in its place right and then what's what's your favorite way of doing syn dihydroxylation somebody Cold dilute potassium, uh, something permanganate. I think it's potassium. Yeah, it's potassium permanganate. Um, yeah, cold dilute potassium permanganate. Other acceptable option would be osmium tetroxide and uh, and hydrogen peroxide. So you could use that one too if you want. But well, potassium permanganate might be easier to remember, or maybe not. It depends. I don't know. It's up to you. Right. And. Well, how do we go from the starting material to that intermediate? E2 with the small base. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, whatever, whatever is a nice small base. Okay, we'll just go with NaOH. Not really not creative, but that's okay. Um, so this is by E2. Yep. Um, Adam, just a question on stereochemistry. So like if the reactant here was enantiomerically pure, would it not matter at the, like would it still produce a racemic product at the end? Yeah, it actually would. Um, I, I, knew, I knew this was coming. Uh, yeah, so you don't actually just get this product, right? Because you'll notice this is a stereo center and the question is asking for one particular orientation of it, but we lose all stereochemistry here, right? This thing is achiral. So if we have stuff that's achiral, right? And we're reacting it with things that are achiral, which, well, we are here, potassium permanganate doesn't have chirality. It's, it's not even a carbon thing, right? Um, then, well, we're going to be, get something that's racemic out at the end. Racemic if it has a, you know, a chiral center, right? Which, okay, well, in this case it does. Okay. So here it has a chiral center, but really this should be racemic.
So for these questions, do they typically want you to give something that only gives that stereochemistry or as long as that's one product, it's okay? Uh, yeah, so this this problem is actually like drawn out poorly because it's, it's show, it suggests that you should get just one product out at the end, but there's no way to do this if uh, by just getting a single product. Um, if I were to ask you, for example, and this is a this is a uh, good follow up question, actually. Um, if I were to ask, what do we start with? We started with this. Um, as an alternate, if we were to go from here, this methyl to, if we wanted to do anti uh, dihydroxylation, that is a super ugly hexagon. Um, if we wanted to do this instead, and this one being pure, this we could actually do. How? Can we just use a peroxide and uh, H3O plus? Okay. Uh, did you mean an epoxide? Or a pero yeah, epoxide or peroxy acid. Yeah. Yeah, so let's say we were to, okay, well, this part we already said, right? We could just use NaOH, not complicated. We just make a Make one of these things, right? Okay. And oh, maybe some of you were like screaming at me because I'm, I, I was saying, okay, we can get this thing to be, this chiral thing to be an antimerically pure, but we have to go through this double bond anyway. So in fact, we can't actually. Uh, so this will be racemic anyway, but whatever. This is still a good problem to do in the first place. Okay. So let's say we use MCPBA. We go here, right? We make our epoxide. Okay. So we're going to get something racemic in the end anyway. The reason for that is because this epoxide can either be sticking up or it could be sticking down. So, sorry, I, I got way ahead of myself on that one. Um, that's fine. How do we how do we open this one up? Do we want to do an acidic opening? Because, uh, Chancellor, that's what you had mentioned. So let's say we do an acidic opening. So if we have something like this, and let's say we just give it water, is the water going to attack above or below? Above, because it's more substituted? Yeah. So yeah, in this case, it'll attack on the one that's on top. Um, yeah, so it'll attack there. And well, in this case, let's say that this epoxide is facing up, then well, in the end, we're going to wind up with this methyl up top, this OH down here, and this OH here. Okay. 
that's in this case but if this this epoxide is on the bottom on the uh if it, if we have it down here instead then we're going to get the other product so uh So this thing is racemic. Uh, yeah, I was getting, was totally getting ahead of myself on that one. Um, yeah, that's okay, right? It was a good problem anyway, because epoxides, they come up a lot, they get asked about a lot. So it's good to see it, good to see them in action. Nice, okay. Let's get something, get something new up. But we, have, we have a little bit of space left here. Okay, here we go, our problem's way up here. Okay, let's see, what is this problem asking for? So, reaction of either cis-butuene, which is, whoops. Oh my God. The ugliest structure. This is cis-butuene and this is trans-butuene. Um, with HBr gives the same product, 2-bromobutane. The reaction is much faster than that of trans-2-butene. Uh, so why is, well, both of these will give you the same product if you react it with Okay, well, if you just react it with HBr. Um, the question is why, uh, let's see. So this is much faster. Okay, and the question is why? Well, what do you all think? I had a thought, but it slipped my mind. Uh, it has something to do with just like using a halogen, a hydrohalogenation, and how if we put the VR on top, I guess it would be easier to put it on the cis. Not easier, but like it'd have less interference if it came on top of the cis. Okay. So you're saying, uh, With the cis, it's like the these things are are like kind of pulled back. You mean, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess yeah. So the, well, the thing is, uh, when you have this thing, if you think about it like a plane, right? The, both of these molecules are planar, like they're both flat. Um, and well, let's see, you first protonate it and then you add the bromine. Yeah. Um, so with either of these, you are, right? So you're taking a pro, uh, you're protonating it. Right. Um, 
and then you're giving a bromine. Okay. Um, and so the, once you're at this intermediate stage, whether it was cis or trans, is it going to make a difference, right? Because this bond, this bond here could rotate around freely like that. It's a single bond now, so it could just rotate however it wants. Um, so what'll really make the difference is this first step. So the first step is what matters. Okay, and the rest is like, whatever. Um, but both of the molecules are planar. So this is all to say, um, the part that matters is when they're both planar. So they're, they're like geometry, their shape doesn't really, it's not, um, doesn't make a huge difference in this case. Would it be like the trans one's just more stable so then it wouldn't really want to protonate as easily? Yeah, exactly. Um, it's, it's actually just that, which is just that uh, this trans molecule is more stable. Uh, trans double bonds are just more stable than cis double bonds in general. Um, part of that being that here you get these kind of bumping into each other. Not really, I guess not, but uh, for whatever reason, trans double bonds are just more stable. And so this guy over here, this is more stable. So it just reacts slower. That's that's kind of just the difference. Um, if you would like, well, we could express it on an energy diagram, right? So, okay, we have this intermediate here. So we know it's gonna go like a bump and then down and then a, another bump and then whatever. And this, this whole part doesn't matter, right? This is irrelevant. Because we said that the first step was going to be the part that that really affects things. Okay. And well, here's the trans that's up here, right? And then the cis is down here. Right. So here's the trans and the cis is the one that's down here. That's it. But yeah, that is that is the trans lower in energy. Oh, it's more stable. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes. So trans is down here, and then this is up top. Exactly. So yeah, that's uh, that's kind of just it in this case. Okay. Save this. And let's keep going. Oh man, it's not even letting me zoom in. All right, that's fine, whatever. It'll work. Um, okay, what's next? So next is, okay, it's more synthesis. Uh, everybody's favorite. Here we go, let's move it up. Okay, uh, synthesize the following, starting with six or fewer carbon atoms. Okay, that's not, okay, yeah, whatever. Um, so it has to be, we have to start with an alkane and it has to have six or fewer carbon atoms. Uh, so we can't just cheat and say like, oh, look, this structure has six or fewer carbon atoms, right? Because this is not an alkane. Alkanes have only uh, carbons and hydrogens. So, okay, we, we have to actually do the problem. Uh, yeah. So...
So we have to start with carbon carbon or carbon hydrogen. Um, yeah, organic chemistry professors or, or just people who write these problems are always really careful to like with how they word the start because if they were like, oh, start with something with six or fewer carbons, then you know, well, we'd be done. So, uh, yeah, it's something that I always look out for. Um, yeah, which is not to say that if you're given a quiz question that's like, oh, start with six or fewer carbons, right? And then you just like write this, um, they'd probably get, they'd probably be pretty upset. So maybe just do the problems. Um, okay, well, there's a reasonable choice, which is, this is very ugly, um, which is this. Oh my God, there we go. So this is a reasonable choice because this is the carbon carbon backbone, right? At this point, we don't know how to actually make or break carbon carbon bonds. Um, well, we could break them. We could do oxidative cleavage, right? Or, or ozonolysis, but well, that's the only thing we can do. Otherwise the carbon carbon bonds have to stay the same. And so this is what we're limited to. So, I, oh wait, I actually did lie. There, you do know one way of making carbon-carbon bonds, which is with, uh, which is with this guy, right? So you could use this and do S and two, but th that's that's not going to happen here, right? There's no reason to do that. So, I'm not going to worry about that. All right. So we want to get to this structure up here, right? And so, let's do retrosynthesis with the ugliest arrow on the planet. All right, let me just, let me just draw this again. Um, so we want this structure over here. Okay, and you'll notice both of these alcohols are, uh, are sin, they're both on the same side, right? So how do you like to do sin dihydroxylation? Well, you've already said it before, so why don't I just put an interesting one? It's osmium tetroxide is a nice way, All right? And we need H2O2, okay? That means we had to start with an alkane and well, I bet you could fill in the rest. So what's this first step gonna be? Carbonation with beer too, and here, like. Yep, exactly. And then the second step is Hoffman or Zaitsev. They use like NaOH. Yeah, so you could use NaOH. It's a Zaitsev product, so it's the more substituted one, and there you go, you're done. Yep. Yeah. Almost exactly the same, same problem mechanism as before. Okay, here we go. Okay, and then next thing has four problems, but well, we can we move through them fairly quickly because they're more synthesis problems, and uh, well, we're getting we're getting pretty good at these, so. Okay. Here we go. We want to make this structure with a bromine on the end. So it's got this square here. Um, and then it's got a methyl bromine. Okay. So we can only start with structures that have carbon and hydrogen. That's part of the problem that I just didn't paste it in. Um, so, okay. In terms of carbons, well, that's easy. Right. We'll start with this. There's no other option. Okay. What else is there no other option for? Combination. Okay, exactly. Uh, you got it again. So yeah, just brominate. Um, 
So you can brominate. Okay, except it's going to stick the bromine onto the wrong spot. And well, we got to do something about that. Okay. Well, how can we get to the final product? We can't just move the bromine from one spot to another. This whole section is on alkanes. So if you really wanted to take a guess, you're probably going to make an alkane, right? Like the OT butyl thing. Yeah. So you want to make the alkane that is on this carbon that sticks out from the side, right? So OT butyl is a nice choice. Okay, and then how do we get this bromine on the less substituted carbon? This is the anti-Markovnikov one. You could use HBr and peroxide. Exactly. Yeah. There we go. Yeah similar kind of structure with all of these problems right you might be starting to pick up on the fact that this is this is kind of a like common theme here so you start with an alkane uh you brominate it or chlorinate or whatever um usually brominate bromine just nobody's asking you to be creative right bromine easiest um you eliminate and then you do an alkene reaction on it kind of uh, common three-step pattern to do. Okay. Oh, this one's actually different. Okay. Um, so here we get something with two carboxylic acids. You only know one way of making carboxylic acids. So what is that? Cleavage with concentrated KMnO4. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, you know, too, because well, I told you another one, but whatever. Um, yeah, this is the this is the good way to do it or the the way that you'll see more commonly. OK. Question is, what do we cleave? So that's tougher. Um, the way that I go about these problems and, and this is like always the strategy to use is you count. So one, two, three, four, five. So there are five carbons, okay? That means we had to have had a five carbon ring. Carbons don't just disappear into thin air, right? So we had to have had a car five carbon ring, which we cleaved at the double bond. Okay. And then well, we can start with this, but I think you know how to get there. So no need for me to tell you. Could you not have like little extra carbons that you put double bonds on and then just like chop them off? You actually can't. Um, okay. You Because you would wind up getting a, like a ketone somewhere else, right? So if you were to say, try to do this, whoops, not even a ketone, right? If you were to have like an extra carbon that just had a double bond. And so let's say we counted carbons, right? One, two, three, four, and five. Well, in this case, we would also cleave here. And so we would get a ketone over here. Oh, like, I mean, if you didn't start with a ring, like if you just had like double bonds on the two sides of like a string thing. Oh. Mm. Yeah, could you? Uh, let's see, if you were to say like... like maybe because seven structure. carbon one or something. And then make double bonds on the two ends and then chop them off. Maybe that's too, I don't know, it's not like obscure for doing this. Yeah, you could do that. Yeah, that's an option. Um, yeah, that works. Uh, yeah, I, I, so I guess I, I picked this answer because um, 
Oh, well, there's actually another reason that you would you'd prefer to do it this way, which is that uh, if we actually started from the start, right, if you were to, to begin with, if you were to begin with this compound, there's no way to reliably make it into this, into this structure. Um, there's just no good way of doing that, like specifically. So using the ring is going to be better. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, it's actually worth mentioning um, a really common type of problem that they like to ask, which this is like, this shows up on like every exam. Uh, so a really common thing that, that they like to ask is to give you some monster of a molecule, some, some absolute huge thing. I don't even know. Like, I, let me come up with some, some real garbage on the spot. Like they'll give you something like this and then like, oh, look, it's got, it's got something over here. And then I don't know, screw it, whatever. It's got some other big, big junk. And, you know, you could go on and on and just make a bunch of like make up the biggest molecule you can think of. Um, and then they'll say, okay, well, you have this thing and then you put it in, you put it in concentrated potassium permanganate and heat it. What do you get? Right. And the idea is just always like, whenever you have one of these double bonds, just split it here and replace it with oxygens. Right. So in this case, like this example, this is like a, a dumb example, but whatever. Right. Um, in this case, you would get like, These two alcohol, uh, these two things, right? Oh, th this would be a ketone, sorry, right? And then you would you would get like this, whatever. This is this is kind of a dumb example, but they they give you some like absolute monsters of molecules, and they they just say like, okay, you put in co co concentrated potassium permanganate, what happens? Um, it's just like a really common thing that shows up. They'll always give one. So expect that. In the reaction, after you add potassium permanganate, uh, do you do ozonolysis? No, nope. Uh, yeah, you just, you just have to add that. I, so I, I actually think you're supposed to add base too. Um, I can't remember actually, this is like the sort of thing that I need to check. No, I don't think you do. Um, there's some, there's some other reaction with potassium permanganate that uses bases and I can't remember exactly which one it is. Um, but you don't, you don't need, I don't think you, for this one, you don't need to use it. Um, yeah. And, and you don't need ozone for this at all. This is separate from ozone analysis. Yep. All right. Last two, we'll just finish them off quick, right? Um, so someone was about to say something, go ahead. Oh, nothing, I was just gonna say thanks. Okay, okay, yeah, no problem. Um, okay, we wanna make this alcohol here at the end, right? Is this Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov, this alcohol? Anti, right? Because that's least substituted. Yeah, exactly. So this is anti-Markovnikov. Okay, how do we make anti-Markovnikov alcohols? BH three THF and then H two O two and AOH. Yeah, exactly. BH three. THF, right, and then what? Hydrogen peroxide and sodium hydroxide. Yeah, exactly. Um, that means we had to have started with this structure, right? And well, again, I think you can fill in those first two steps. OK, 
Okay. And this last one is a real monster. This is like a real, this, these are these are absolute pains. So remember that D is just like a hydrogen. It reacts exactly the same, except it's just special, it's labeled. So, well, we're starting with things that only have carbon and hydrogen, not this deuterium. So we're adding deuteriums. What is the only way that we know to add two hydrogens or two deuteriums? Uh, H2 and the metal catalyst. Exactly. Yeah. So in this case, we'll use D2 because we're attaching these deuteriums, right? Does this reaction, how does this reaction put those hydrogens on? Would it just be like a sin addition? Like, because the final thing can rotate into like this anti looking thing. But um, when you do like the, like when you add like D2, what is not just like always sin. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Right. So th in this case, they just rotated the molecule around the single bond just to like make this problem way more painful. Right. But it adds sin. Okay. So we have to just do that. We have to do the like expend all that extra brain power to to rotate the double bond. Um, and I think I did it right here. You just got to do it carefully. You could build a model if you want. Um, easier way to do it, right? And from here, well, if we're taking these deuteriums off and we, we think about just like flattening the molecule to make an alkane, well, well, we flatten the molecule, right? So I could say, for example, this hydrogen is gonna to go to the right. And this one that's out front is gonna to go to the right. So here is hydrogen, hydrogen, methyl, methyl. That's it. So that is, is it. Is that what time is it? Damn, it's 101. We're a minute over. Almost made it. Um, there we go. I'll stop the screen share. Um, we even.